Welcome to The O Show. I'm Laura Babcock, and there is a lot going on in our province that is impacting us locally, and everyone is in the same fight. Fight for the things that matter. Fight for our environment, fighting against the green belt and taking over of our land. Fighting against privatization in our healthcare system that is shutting down hospitals across this province and fighting against the crush of homelessness and lack of affordable housing. Uh, we are all in this together, Ontario, and the impact is affecting all of us. One councillor actually proactively put together an impact report on their own job performance over the last year. I've never seen anything like it, so I wanted to talk to councillor Cameron Kret. I want to talk about a story that just came out, and I'm so pissed off about it, I don't even, I can't even. Uh, there is a pregnant woman who, you know, is expecting soon uh, from the photos and uh, was booted out of Hamilton City Housing. You couldn't create more of a Mary and Joseph scenario before Christmas if you tried. And so far, the response from the city, like, give her a bunch of names for shelters where she's not getting calls back. I mean, what the hell happened and what are we doing about it? Welcome to the O Show, by the way. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah, I read about that story probably when you did. And it's really hard to read and, and difficult to hear. And you're right, we're not doing enough right now to provide resources to that person to transition. I don't know what's going on. We don't get briefed uh, as board members about every eviction that happens. Um, there's sometimes good reasons for evictions. Sometimes um, there's situations like this, which it seems like we should be doing more to support this person, help them transition, ensure that they're not going to be you know, homeless over the course of the winter. I've emailed folks over at City Housing Hamilton and waiting to hear back from them. Uh, as I've said on Twitter, I'm willing to do what I can to help with the situation because you know, we can't have people being forced out of their housing into the cold. We know what the impacts of that are. We know that it causes harm to people. We know that it can cause death. We know the winter is a very dangerous time for people. Yes. And so none of us want to see this happening. And uh, I'll wait to hear back from the staff involved before I can really say much more. Yeah, I understand. Uh, I was very critical, as you know, of um, the mayor and council on CHCH this week, based on an op-ed I penned last week, around the handling of homelessness and housing. And for people watching, I mean, the, the reason for that is this, is this urgency, right? We, we seem to scramble when we find out that we're booting out a pregnant woman who's like at the line of homelessness right now. Uh, but then when it comes to other things like putting in proactive policies around tiny shelters that maybe would have helped her situation, right? Or uh, actually getting affordable housing built. We seem to, as a city, keep finding excuses and delays. And I'm not lumping you into that specifically around HATS because you were the counselor who did stand up in their ward and took the incoming and took threats, threats against your life for just trying to put up some, some shelter houses that council finally approved after years. Um, and I was angry because your colleagues did not support you visibly. I did not see, as I said on, on the news, the mayor getting you all in front of the Hamilton sign at City Hall and saying, council voted for this tiny shelter project. We're doing it, right? And if you don't like it, too bad. That's, we're not going to be bullied. We need to do what we need to do as a city. So Cameron, I just, I have to put it out there because, you know, I continue to be enraged when I hear stories like this woman, this Mary looking for shelter there's no room at the inn and we could have had a little barn like in the jesus story right but we don't even have the little barn because council couldn't follow through so do you want to just comment on the the hats thing and my my continued outrage on that and then i want to talk to you about something else on council uh, a decision to go forward with public house, public property for affordable housing and how some of your colleagues have managed to um in my mind use the hats catastrophe to their own NIMBY advantage. And I, I'm pissed about that too. So go ahead. I'm a little grinchy today, aren't I, Cameron? I just hate seeing people <laughs> suffer. I hate seeing no, and I understand that. Yeah, I get it. And, and none of us want to see that. I think the problem with hats has been around for a really long time. And once this became politicized, it, from my experience and what I saw from the outside before I was in council was that it was doomed. And so that was why I pledged before I was elected, after I was elected, 
that if this came forward, I would support a location. So we could get the due diligence part done because that has always been the last bit. Hats kept coming back to council saying, look, give us a location. If you give us a location, we can complete the other part of the due diligence we have to do and, and see if it'll work and if it's feasible. And then you know we'll have a better and clearer picture of what, what we can do to support people. And there was an urgency. Yeah. We wanted to get this in there before winter because we recognize that it's a very dangerous time for people to be outside. And in that emergency and in that urgency, I was like, okay, we can't uh, be debating locations for six months here. We've got to settle on something. And I said, I would do that. If, if the city staff came forward with their land use planning advice to say, this is the spot they thought based on that situation we could do, uh, set something up, great. Um, and unfortunately hats went through the due diligence process and weren't able to go ahead with the project they had a statement they released that talked a bit about it, a bit about it being more expensive than they thought to do it in that location. But come uh, on, talked about some of the other issues. So come on, yeah. some of the other issues. Okay, this is what drives me fucking crazy. Sorry, Cameron. I'm so sorry. Fredericton has done it. Kitchener Waterloo has done it. All across the country, communities have figured out how to do it. Peterborough just did it. So I do not believe that it can't be done by a city as big as Hamilton. What was really going on with the hats thing, from my perspective, was the reason why they couldn't possibly move forward. Those other things could have been managed. They have tons of support, donors, everything else. There's been death by delay for two years by this council on this project. And then when they finally got a location, there was an organized effort to bully both yourself, both the mayor, and and threaten the people who would be living there. So what organization is going to go forward and put people who are already vulnerable fighting for their freaking lives into a situation where there's been threats against how they're going to be treated? I mean, I just want us to call this for what it is. It is an incredibly shameful moment in Hamilton's history that the people were extending threats to people who are homeless it makes me so angry and i just have to tell you i might cry i'm gonna try not to but i happen to be driving in the car with somebody down victoria street uh where there are all kinds of tents and this person i found out when they saw the tents had spent years in a homeless shelter as a child and they said to me laura why can't they give them shelter like i had with my mom so Cameron, I'll just put it back to you on the hats thing. I just don't want us to pretend it was a financing issue when we damn well know the politicization of it was a violence issue in part. Yeah, definitely. There were a lot of things going on there, right? Some of it was financial, some of it was surely about the response. And you saw all kinds of folks uh, online, offline, at events um, who were threatening people. Uh, there were threats against the folks at hats. There were threats against the potential future residents. Myself and the mayor were threatened. So definitely that had something to do with it. Uh, I'm not going to say that it didn't. I'm just sort of relying on what Hat said publicly when they made their decision. And they yeah. did talk about some of the, the impact. I think that they never got to do the community consultation that they promised they would do before it was set up. That was part of the plan, right? Is that there would be a chance to do that. They never really had the opportunity to do that. And part of it, I think, is definitely for the city to think through. Uh, we've seen engagement change a lot. So uh, even in my time in Hamilton, I've seen engagement shift. There's a lot more. People want to have more of a say. And the city's not really ready for that kind of engagement. And what's required to have that robust engagement, excellence in AV equipment, uh, making sure spaces are completely accessible, uh, making sure we have big enough spaces. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of it comes down to the fact that downtown hasn't had the investments it deserves. I am in the process right now with a, with a report before council asking for partners around Ward 2 to come forward to give us space for free to hold meetings because the city doesn't have enough accessible spaces because the investments didn't happen. And to the credit um, on the... On the council floor, everyone kind of acknowledged that this was an issue and there's a plan coming forward to deal with it and to actually make sure we have the resources we need. In the meantime, um, yeah, it's very disappointing and very disheartening to see this. And it's really troubling that we're dealing with another winter where we're not able to provide the housing people need. And yes, the municipality has a huge role to play in being able to manage this crisis. I want people to know who are watching this, have that big role that the province and the federal government can play in coming to the table. We recently had a prime minister come to Hamilton that said the housing wasn't a federal issue. I was totally blown away by that comment. Um, it doesn't help us to work together when we can't all acknowledge there's a problem and decide that it's a major priority. Trudeau, and right now, I don't see seriousness from the prime minister or the premier on this issue at all. Neither do I. Ne neither do I. So federally, I mean, what, what the hell? I mean, it, what's the point of a national housing strategy if you're not saying that it's a federal issue? And and the new housing minister federally seems to be making some positive waves, and they better keep that, turn that into a tsunami 
federally, uh, or the party is losing so much credibility. Uh, provincially, I think it's I think it's more nefarious than that. I mean, homeless. Well, there's just a, a story that I posted today about how homeless people are using the ERs as their last point of of survival, right? And that's the most expensive warming center possible compared to a shelter bed, which would be you know it's ten times less expensive to create social housing for people than to create shelter beds, and it's even more expensive to have them in the ERs. And who's who's not funding ERs? And you know, nurses are being posted from ERs and being sold back their services at three times the rate the taxpayers are paying for private agencies to make money. It's profiteering in a pandemic as far as I'm concerned. So I don't think it's just a lack of funding. I think it no, is. You, no, you're right. It's a much bigger, scarier agenda that we're seeing in this province, and I'm not paranoid. There are tons of evidence now after the AG's report. So I'm I'm glad you're taking accountability from the municipal lens, which is the only lens really. That's your view, right? That's your sight lines is municipally and what you can do about it. So let's talk about something that I thought when I started to read the article today, I was like, yay, the mayor's getting it. She's making a strong urgency comment publicly. Ah, that's what I want. Uh, and then as I read through the article, it was like, yeah, we're going to get, you know, all these city lots and affordable housing and charities are going to be private, public, all that good stuff. Rah, rah, let's go. Um, not just cheerleading, but actually, you know, calling a play, acting like a quarterback. I was excited. And then I got to the bottom of the article and I saw the language that was used by one of the counselors to delay two of those lots. And it and they used the hats example as a reason not to proceed at this time. And I thought to myself, how the situation at HATS, which I thought to be deliberate, intentional, organizational resistance, it's just my take from an outside perspective, has metastasized and given these counselors this justification to say, see how terrible that situation went down, that situation I did nothing about as a leader to stop? Well, now I'm using it as justification why we can't go ahead in this neighborhood unless I talk to everyone. Who's going to say yes to affordable housing if they get the choice? Nobody wants density in their neighborhoods. We're not idiots. People are not going to want it. So what are we doing here? Affordable housing is now a luxury instead of a city priority? Yeah, I was really disappointed to see that come forward. And I think that what I said in the council floor was that I think this is disingenuous consultation. What's the question you're asking at that consultation meeting exactly? As you put it, are you asking people if they would like to have affordable housing in these spaces, if they want these, these uh, to be sold off in a certain kind of way? And it's great if you want to talk about the impacts, but we make a city-wide priority for affordable housing, and we commit to saying this matters to us. And we commit to other levels of government when we do that. When you come forward with city assets, other levels of government have already said to us, look, what we need to do is see you putting something on the table. One of the things we have the most access to is land. We bring that land to the table. The provincial government, the federal government can jump in and say, okay, we've got some funding. We can partner with you to make this happen. We start playing games with, well, we can do it here, but not here. Uh, we'll do it in this ward and we'll do it in the downtown core, but we won't do it out in East Hamilton. Uh, when, we, when we have those kinds of conversations, I think they degrade the conversation overall. They cause us to look like we're not serious. Right. And frankly, um, they go against, I think, what most people who ran for council said they cared about doing here. They cared about making sure we did more to approve affordable housing, use our lands to strategic use. Um, and I think that this is unfortunate. What it is, though, is a delay for the conversation. So a consultation will happen. We'll come back in February and then we'll get to vote. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was an organized effort to try and come forward saying, you know, I don't want this here. We don't want this here. Look, you can't vote not to expand the urban boundary and then stop trying to approve density uh, in, in specific wards. Density needs to be approved everywhere. And if this was truly about consulting with people and, and really about saying, look, we have a variety of options here. Um, we can go ahead and have a discussion here. And if you really wanna go this way, it's fine. Or that way, it's fine. There's a whole bunch of things. That's not what's going on here. This is an affordable housing crisis. There are no options. We must take this seriously. We must use our land assets to contribute to building more affordable housing. We must acquire more affordable housing. We must keep the housing we have that's affordable, affordable. Like these are all things that are basically are part of the housing sustainability investment roadmap that everyone in council agreed to. So I find it hard when we agree to all these principles. We put all this housing secretary in place. We say we're going to do all this stuff. And then some of us say, well, not in my ward. 
yeah. or I want I want to have consultation. And then, as you say, um, use a disingenuous framing to suggest that this is really about uh, something else. This is about making sure we hear from residents. I get it. Residents want to be heard on this. No problem. But as uh, Councillor Kassar and others uh, asked some really important questions at that meeting, they said, has this land been zoned for this use uh, since has it been zoned for 20 years? And the staff came back and said, no, it's been zoned this way since 1992. 31 years. If people wanted to talk about the zoning use and talk about not having certain housing there, not having residential and commercial mixes of, of, of use there, they've had 30 years to object to it. And so going there now and trying to say, well, uh, you're going to get affordable housing seems stigmatizing. And I'm very worried about that conversation, the tone of it, the tenor of it. And this about this about being someone saying, well, I don't want it to happen here. I want it to happen somewhere else. So I don't think those conversations help us. Mm -hmm. I think they hurt us. I think they make us look like we're not working together. And yeah. that's why I oppose the motion. Well, good. Uh, and but I have to say a couple of things. One is that uh, because I run campaigns publicly, <laughs> this is my I know how to do stuff like this. And when I see what the energy and effort that went into hats, it was when I saw the lawn signs that I'm like, nah, right. This is not a couple of neighbors who are a little concerned and need more information. This is an organized campaign. And then to see a counselor take that campaign outcome and use it for this delay, when, as you said, those lands have been zoned that way for 31 years, it's a council priority. Everybody said on the big picture, yeah, yeah, all about affordable housing, but now they get to use the hat scenario. I don't want that happening again. You know what? It makes me kind of sick. And I was, I was disappointed to see that a former housing minister, Ted McMeekin, voted for the delay in the consultation. I got no problem with consultation if it's legit. I didn't think those red green card nonsense sessions in the summer were legit. I didn't think using all that taxpayer money for big black signs on every freaking highway that cost a fortune uh, that said encampments. Woo. I mean, the whole thing to me was gross. And then to see what happened with hats. I mean, I don't buy it when the same group of people who are looking at pausing this use of these properties are the same group of people who accidentally stopped the the bylaw going forward on the vacant unit tax and i have to ask you why'd you miss the damn meeting i know you put it on twitter but i can't have you here cam without saying like you get paid a lot of money to be there it was on the schedule that council was meeting you left early why we know narinder's mom was in the hospital why weren't you there yeah, I had another meeting to be at. And honestly, I didn't think there'd be a conflict. The meeting was supposed to have ended a lot earlier. It didn't. I put off that meeting for a while. And so I thought, all right, we're going to be voting on the bills here. And usually what happens when you vote on the bills is maybe one or two councillors want to just say they're opposed for the principle of it. But I've never seen it happen before on a bill that it would get voted down that way. And the reason why, Laura, I'll tell you exactly why I felt confident leaving the meeting at that time. And obviously it was my mistake. And you know that's something for me to reflect on that, that I didn't see that type of thing coming. Our procedural bylaw actually has a written right in there that no bill or bylaw can fail on the floor of council unless you reconsider the motion it was attached to. We didn't do that. And I can't explain to you why that didn't happen because I wasn't at the meeting. I watched the video back, I think what happened was two things. One, um, that was a surprise to people. And then the person who was in the chair had a conflict. So then it became difficult for there to be an, another ruling there, right? And so people the were surprised by it. Has a, vacant, yeah. has a vacant unit. So she right. wasn't able to, to help it. But the person who put it forward though is like a 30 plus year counselor, correct? I can't buy. I know Tom apparently <laughs> says it was all just whoops or whatever, but I mean, come on. Like if the one person in that room who knows more about procedures and what happens is the guy who moved this thing. And the vacant unit tax would have brought possibly millions to the affordable to housing build in this city. Um, and the only people who benefit from not proceeding with it are absentee landlords and, 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 and you know, and investors in our, like the people who are creating the housing supply issues. Uh, so, I mean, I, I uh, well, a couple of things about this I think are important to mention, Laura. I do. Um, number one, the vote on the vacant unit tax happened in January, and, and we had that vote and it passed. And the people that were on side of that vote, I think there were 10 at the time and five opposed. Again, there was no reason to think, no reason to think, leaving that vote, that there was anything that would happen. 
I didn't hear any of my council colleagues say that they wanted to reconsider it and do a reconsideration vote. I looked at the bylaw and thought, okay, great. This is going to be a vote on the bill. Um, it can't be defeated without doing reconsideration. And there simply aren't the votes for that. But what happened in that moment were a couple of things. I think things even Tom didn't expect, right? I don't think Tom expected councillors to change their votes. Um, so those who had voted in favor of it, now some, one at least, changed their vote. And so that's what the tipping balance was there. And again, I think this is frankly just a procedural issue that we didn't foresee. We need to update our procedural bylaw law, which I've been advocating for for the last six, seven years. Once that gets updated, I think we can prevent these things from happening in the future. I think it's still going to get resolved in a way that's not going to stop this from going forward. And legally, we can't. There's all these recommendations from January. Only the bottom one talks about the bylaw. You can't nullify all these other recommendations, including spending $300,000 to hire staff and set the program up and spending months of staff's time working on this. You can't nullify that by just not passing the bylaw. So I think that there's been some reporting on this that's made it a little bit foggy. And I want people to understand this is a minor procedural motion that went in a weird way. This is not, and I mean this, this is not undo the program itself. Now it's up to council to figure out how to deal with that. I'm hopeful that on December 13th, some of those folks who say, hey, we didn't intend for it to go this way, this wasn't going to be the way, we'll actually put forward a reconsideration motion so we can reconsider that and have a have another vote on it. And if they don't want to do that, that's up to them. Again, I think there's other ways to sort this out, and I think it'll be sorted out in the future. But you own the fact that you had a scheduled meeting that you're getting paid for and you didn't stay and there was consequence. Yeah, I own the fact for not staying at that for that last little bit of the meeting. Totally. Like, And again, uh, I would say that if you look at my attendance record, pretty stellar. I've been to more votes than almost everybody at council. So okay. I'm not going to, honestly, I'm not going to feel uh, guilty for missing something that I thought was procedurally going to be played by the rules. If we played by the rules according to the bylaw, there'd have been no problem here. I couldn't have anticipated that would be the case. I I'm, stepped I'm out really thinking, hey, you know what? I've got somewhere else. Um, I've also got to be I have many responsibilities as a counselor. I get paid to do all kinds of stuff. So sit in meetings is part of those, but I have lots of different meetings I got to go to. So I get it. I prioritize something else instead, thinking this wasn't a priority. It wasn't going to be a big issue, I was wrong. And so if I have to be, uh, unfortunately, now in a position where I've got to second guess my colleagues, uh, worried about not being able to trust that things will go ahead procedurally as they should, fine, you'll see me there fiercely for every single vote. Well, I think people that are here from in Hamilton, myself included, if I miss a meeting as a consultant, that's my client's money and they're not happy about it. And you're the taxpayer's money and people weren't happy about it. So I'm glad that we've we've talked about that. I want to move to, uh, and just one final point to kind of button up this, is the reason for my skepticism about that uh, bylaw thing that had never happened before and the opposition to hats and the, oh, we have to go to consultation around using city property for affordable housing is to me, when I start to see patterns, right? I start to question what the true agenda is. And I am terrified for the people in this city who are being continuously red evicted. And we have research now from another community uh, that I read recently that says that the people showing up on the street are people who were living in poverty but could afford the rent. They are now older people like seniors. We are kicking out into the curb who are now showing up at shelters and at food banks. I mean, what are we doing? And I, I said this on CH, people in Hamilton need to examine their hearts. Whatever you think you don't want to see, I live across from public housing. Whatever you think it is or how terrible it's going to be, just suck it up, right? We need densification. We need public housing. We need to support the people who are our neighbors. As my neighbor who is a, a, you know, a refugee said, the poor can't get poor, right? So we have to help them. We just can't leave it like this. So let me talk to you about something. Yeah, before you, before you go off that, Laura, I think it's really important to say something here. You're focused on exactly the right detail, people. What I think some on council are preoccupied with are vacant units, um, other vacant things that don't have any people in them. Who are we protecting in that situation, right? What's that about? We should be looking to protect people where they're housed to get them housed. This vacant unit tax that's been proposed has the potential to raise millions of dollars to help for affordable help affordable housing in our city and has the, the opportunity to lead us down other conversations. What about vacant unit taxes for commercial properties? We see enough of those in the city that aren't being taxed and are being left there for, for you know, decades, sometimes generations. There's a whole big conversation here and a strange, as far as I'm concerned, preoccupation with trying to protect vacant things, protect the units themselves and protect the investments that people have in those units. People need housing. Housing is a human right. If we're going to continue to commodify housing and increase that commodification, this is only going to get worse. We're either committed to affordable housing, committed to making sure people uh, get to have housing as a human right or not. 
I don't know, and we could spend hours on this, my friend, um, if people understand the, I think I called it today, creating a, a chaotic systems failure, failure, but the, it's not just that we lack affordable housing supply and that government's under planned for it, and underbuilt for it. It's that when people can't afford their health care, can't get access to their ER rooms, can't find a place to live, even a place to rent, can't find a shelter bed to go to, the costs on the taxpayer and the residential tax base will only increase as cities are crippled under this chaotic collapse of our health care and our housing system. And so anyone, any councillor, I'm talking to you, whoever, all of you who voted against some of these things, if you are thinking that your little NIMBY argument or your little you know, constituent who's going to be mad at you or your donor who's going to give you a hard time and you know, your, your next election is more important than doing everything you can to shore up and bulwark against what is happening, you're not seeing the big picture in this province and in our city. You think poverty is bad now? wait 10 years you think homelessness is bad now wait 10 years every single time you take a vote that is counterintuitive to the crisis that we're in to leaning into the crisis as as i saw your colleague maureen wilson say this morning in the paper any vote you take has impacts that will resonate and further drive people into poverty and homelessness and death so check yourself on every one of these little tiny little votes because it matters in the big picture. I was in one of the richest areas of Hamilton the other day doing some Christmas shopping and there was a teenage girl walking through live traffic begging. A teenage girl, she might have been 16, in the middle of the afternoon, could have been killed at any point by a single car. And I, my heart broke when I spoke to her. You don't want your kids to live like that. You might be privileged and wealthy, but you're putting a whole lot of Hamiltonians at, at risk in an opioid crisis and a homeless crisis. And you better have a fucking good reason for these little votes you're taking because they have huge impacts. Sorry for the rant, Cam, but I just, I can't stand it. Either they don't see the same suffering or they don't care or they're beholden to some interests, uh, developer interests or whatever the hell. And, you know, and it's I'm going to expose it and everybody else should as well, because come on. Now, I want to talk to you about something that you jumped on this morning, which is shocking. Again, there are people living in a McMaster residence who have uh, milky water coming out of their pipes and and big bugs. I mean, what the hell is going on there, Cam? Yeah, it's a really disturbing situation. And I mean, this has been a project since the get go that a lot of people in the downtown community had questions about. Uh, first, the city gave kind of a deal to McMaster on the land and gave them a break with respect to, I think it was respect to taxes to let them build student housing downtown. Then McMaster got involved with a real estate investment firm. You started seeing the sort of designs for the units being really small units. And you saw some of the rents attached to this. They, those rents don't even correlate to the funding the university provides to masters and PhD students. And that's who's living there, Laura, it's graduate students. They're coming to this university with the expectation that their research is valued, they're gonna be doing theses, they're gonna be providing input and uh, research to the larger world uh, in terms of uh, what we know and knowledge, and they get funded to do that. But the funding doesn't even meet the threshold for their affordability of these units. So they're in there already kind of paying probably in debt to live there. Um, in, I, I don't remember the exact square foot right now, but you'd be shocked if you saw the floor plan. And when I talked to the university about it, they said, look, you know, it's a complicated arrangement we have with the people who built this and it's a funding formula. I thought like, well, this is one of the problems when you get involved with real estate investment firms to build public housing for students is you get in these situations. And I thought, okay, you know, I've made my critical comments about this. I don't think it's a good development. I didn't think though, based on the promotional video I saw for this, that a bunch of people were in before it was built, that this would turn out to be like this where people are having to worry about being contaminated by the water they drink, um, worried about bugs and mice and other kinds of things in a brand new building um, that, that people were calling- At University you know, in Canada, in one of the largest cities in Canada, we have students who are worried about contamination from their drinking water. And I know Canada has done a terrible job with good drinking water on our First Nations, so I, I'm not in any way uh, excusing the fact that we've got a huge problem. In cities, new builds, 
big universities, how can this not be addressed immediately? I mean, it all should be with drinking water, but how is this not being addressed? Was there urgency in their response, Cam? What I saw from public health was they did go in there. There was some water line flushing. I heard about some of the stuff in the article. And then since I've read it, because I didn't know about this issue until I read it about it either. Um, and so I've seen there's been some proactive steps taken, but McMaster was still telling people that it may not, it may not be safe to drink the water in your building. I think this is the result of us getting too involved with privatizing public interests. Yep. Public universities like they shouldn't necessarily be getting involved in a situation like this where they're involved, where they're leveraging themselves so far that they're having to skimp on the very basic stuff to the point that people are now not sure if the water in the tap is safe to drink. I mean, there's all kinds of problems with that. People have got to shower, right? They've got to wash dishes. They've got all kinds of things to do with water. And now they've got these water coolers in the hall. We saw this with 1083 Main Street East earlier, mm -hmm. right? Where was issues with water. We know, and we've known forever, that in order for there to be true public good, we have to ensure that the public, meaning governments, have a very, very big role in ensuring the safety, quality, health of these units. Private uh, interests aren't necessarily held to the same standard and don't have the same outcomes. They're not accountable to the public. Governments are accountable to the public. And so I think this should be a wake-up call for the other project that's being built down the road, um, very similarly with, as far as I know, the same partners. I think the article mentioned that. And so I think that we have to be very thoughtful about when the city gets involved in these projects, what we're asking for, and ensuring that before they're moved into, they're complete. This also isn't even a fully complete building, according to the article. I walk by it all the time and I can see that. They're still doing work on the building, but people are living there. And so if we can't meet these timelines and deadlines for construction, then we ought not to be putting people in in the building in the first place. Oh, like, it's really easy. And, and, Wait a year until it's completely finished and you've done all the things you need to do to ensure that it's healthy and safe and then let people live there. Except, but, when, you, except like, when you create a housing crisis where the supply is so beneath the demand, people will take anything they can get their hands on. I get calls from clients and, and other, you know, uh, on-air people in other cities when their kids come to Mac going, is there anything, Laura, anywhere that our kid can live, right? So, I mean, these these buildings can be crap and people can be moving into crap buildings early, whereas 10, 15 years ago, they would never have considered it because there's nowhere else to go. So this is why I'm just saying this collapse of our system around us to privatization. Uh, I ran a chamber of commerce. I've owned a business for 25 years. No one would have thought me, you know, a socialist, but I'm also looking at it and it seems by design and I'm getting deeply, deeply concerned that we are losing not just our middle class, but we're losing our sense of of fairness and kindness and public health in this country. Uh, it's deeply, deeply concerning. Let's pivot, though, to another project that I promised I'd talk to you about, Cam. Uh, LRT, uh, that old that old Hamilton, you know. What do you mean? Thing. Never heard of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 53 <laughs> votes on council, 16 years since initial public fed, provincial funding was announced and Champagne was popped. Uh, and here we are. They still at Metrolinks have not gone out even to an RFQ on this, according to the LRT watchdog in town. So is council going to do anything? I know that Metrolinks isn't getting stuff done in other places either. Uh, but I mean, what can we do about LRT? I think that it's a little less dire in terms of a timeline than maybe is being reported. So no, we don't have an RFQ done yet, but that's going to be happening as far as I know once City Council makes a recommendation to Metrolinks in January. So right now, what we're doing is we're going through a process of um, looking at some of the what we'll call macro designs, right? Like what's the big picture going to look like here? Some of the detailed stuff's already started happening on Sherman and Ward 3 in terms of actual shovels in the ground and doing some of the, the preliminary work. So that's happening. And now it's about us signaling to Metrolinks where we want to go in terms of operations and maintenance of the LRT. Once we give them our vote, then they get to make that decision and then they put the RFQ. Ultimately, it's up to them. Uh, but we can certainly make a recommendation. I know I'll be putting forward a uh, motion in January asking that we have uh, the city do operations and maintenance. But again, ultimately, that's up to Metrolinks. There's going to be some more information coming forward from them soon. I think we're generally speaking on track. I think, though, it's one of the consequences of the way we have uh, our electoral system set up. I think we look at the issues we spoke about today. A lot of them come down to that. We have a two, basically speaking, a two-party system in Ontario and a two-party system in, in the country. What that allows people to do, unfortunately, is wait till election time. 
to make promises, to try and hedge bets, to try and um, get themselves back in office and switch out red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. And there's a certain, a certain expiry for each one of these situations. And then we get the other party back in again. What that does, it doesn't create a lot of motivation for uh, governments and majorities, especially like in Ontario, to do anything in between elections. So what we get, unfortunately, is a lot of this kind of stop and go. I Let's still, be honest, they're doing a yeah. lot. I mean, they're building a super spa paying uh, half a billion dollars for a garage. They are uh, trying to take land out of the green belt. I mean, they're doing stuff. They're just not doing this stuff. <laughs> you know? Well, I think they're, they're staying away from issues that they think are politically sensitive because they want to worry about getting elected in, in the next four-year cycle. And that's the problem. The whole thing started, unfortunately, I think, when we had uh, the project ready, sat there on the desk of the then liberal premier, Kathleen Wynne. But before she left for office, she could have signed it. We could have got this done. I've still always thought to myself, what's this about, right? Because there was always this period of time just before the hands changed, just before the election really got going. We had our thing in there, just could have signed that and got it done. But again, because it was a political hot potato, decided to wait, hedge bets, try to get back into office. And I think this is a big problem that we have in Ontario. It's a big problem we have federally is that we don't have the right representation of the table proportional to the people who live here. It's just a red blue game. Uh, I think it's the one import from the United States that is really hurting our country, hurting our province and hurting our city. Well, yeah, I've been on a chair all day on Twitter about the import from the U.S. Uh, in terms of what's happening federally, but I'll save that for another O show. Uh, I do have Kathleen Wynne coming back on the program, and um, you know, and it just brings to mind the the gas plant scandal, right? You know, that was an election decision. And to your point, sometimes politics gets in the absolute way of being accountable to the public and to the public purse and to public projects. You, sir, uh, are accountable. You put out your own accountability document that people can look at. I think that it's important that people check it out. I think other counselors and others watching in other communities across Canada should take a look at your impact report to see what it can look like when a municipal councillor decides to proactively hold themselves accountable to their time and their work and their projects. So I, I commend you on that. Uh, and um, thank you for taking my ire and wrath this morning, councillor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I actually had a client say to me this morning when they were catching up on all the things that have been going on uh, in, in our province and in our communities, and they said, you know, the thing that's making them the most upset about all of the things we've talked about, this privatization and this systematic underfunding and the poverty and everything else, is that she feels people in Ontario are having a hard time feeling joy anymore. It feels like this constant crushing uh, problem that's getting worse and there doesn't seem to be a lot of political will and accountability to fix it. Uh, and, you know, and she said that we're building up a bitterness in this province and a sense of hopelessness. So I just want to leave our viewers with something very important, which is it is not hopeless. And none of these things that I've been talking about and decrying and warning about are inevitable. They are choices that we make when we go to the polls, choices that we make when we hold or don't hold our local politicians accountable for things like we've been talking about on this program, choices when we don't decide to show up and raise our voices, we got the green belt reversed, we can get other things fixed, but we don't have to wait till elections. We have choices every single day, whether we want to engage or we want to ignore, whether we want to find hope and promote hope or whether we want to throw up our arms in despair. Do not despair. We can change these things to a Canada that is right and just, and by right, I mean right by people and just and equitable. We can do it, but it's never going to be by taking our eyes off what's going on by our political parties, whether they're red, blue, or orange, or green. We have to keep our eyes on all of them. Thank you so much for being on the Osho, Cameron. And thank you to watch for watching and subscribing on YouTube. Uh, our Osho audience is getting mighty and really, really powerful in terms of helping to move the needle on the things that we need to do in this province and in this country. So thank you so much. And in our city of Hamilton, take care, Cam. Thanks for having me. When you care about current affairs, it's on the Osho. And when you want to get clear what's going on here, it's on the old show. If you like to stay in the know, tune yourself into the old show. It's the old show. Laura Babcock's the old show. With a lot of great guests, she puts them to the test on the old show. There's no doubt they'll be calling them out on the old show. Stand for something or fall for it all. Ontario, hear the call on the old show podcast, the old show.
show. Laura Babcock's the old show. Stay informed with the old show, old show.